Whitney Tilson. Maybe that's a name you recognize from a segment on 60 Minutes or remember from an interview on CNBC or Bloomberg or Fox or know well because of a Wall Street Journal profile or his Kiplinger column. As a founder and managing partner of Case Capital Management, he is a respected voice for value investing and behavioral finance and speaks and write, wi writes widely on the subjects. Whitney Tilson has a long time interest in education. Some, and I'm one of those, call it an obsession. His belief in the power of education and that every student, no matter the income of his family, deserves a fair shot at the American dream. After graduating from Northfield Mount Hermon School, Harvard College, and Harvard Business School, he was a founding member of Teach for America. In New York, he is involved with charter schools and is, and is a KIPP New York board member. He spent much of his childhood in Tanzania and Nicaragua and continues his interests in Africa, involving himself in charities directed towards African education reform. However, 30 years ago, Whitney was sitting with his class beneath the trees in the Dell, just as you are sitting here today. He had received an academic award for outstanding achievement. One of his teachers had said, Whitney is clearly heading for honors and a distinguished professional career somewhere in the future. That future is now and today it is my pleasure to introduce Whitney R. Tilson, Eagle Brook class of 2000, I mean 1882. <laughs> 1982. I can't get the numbers right. So, Headmaster Chase, uh, teachers, parents, friends, and fellow Brookies, thank you for inviting me back to Eagle Brook to speak to you. It is truly an honor. I remember when I was sitting where you were 35 years ago, almost to the day, um, and I listened to the commencement speaker, and she was delightful, but I have to confess, I don't remember anything she said. So that's my challenge today, uh, to say something that's both meaningful and memorable. That's a tall order. I'd like to frame my remarks by telling you a little bit about myself and why I'm here. I don't think the school invited me to address you today because of my day job. Uh, I manage a hedge fund I started 17 and a half years ago. It, my business has been reasonably successful, but I'm not one of those billionaire hedge fund managers you read about. Now, I think I'm here because of what I've done in terms of making a difference in the world, in particular in the area of education reform. My parents are both teachers. Uh, they met and married in the Peace Corps in 1962, and I grew up, spent most of my childhood in Tanzania and Nicaragua. So I've always had an interest in education, but my involvement really began uh, when I was graduating from Harvard in 1989 and was weighing job offers from a few uh, investment banks and consulting firms. But then a friend introduced me to his sister who was graduating from Princeton who had this crazy idea to recruit and train top graduating college students and send them into poor areas to teach for at least two years. His sister was Wendy Kopp and, uh, who was planning to start Teach for America. I thought it was a great idea and that she was a brilliant entrepreneur and so I deferred a job at the Boston Consulting Group and moved to New York City that fall to help Wendy launch Teach for America. Being one of the early founders of something that's been so successful and impactful was a life-changing experience for me. It showed me that one person with a great idea and a lot of smarts and energy can have a huge impact on the world, and ever since I've tried to follow in Wendy's big footsteps. Though I have a very full-time job, I make a big effort in my spare time fighting to make sure that every kid in this country gets an education that's half as good as the one here. I won't bore you with the details, but I've been on the board of KIPP charter schools in New York City for a dozen years, helped start an organization called Democrats for Education Reform, and uh, as Andy noted, I'm a prolific writer and blogger on this topic. I'm motivated by a sense of outrage that this country has an educational system that is deeply unequal in which poor and minority children, who most need the best schools and teachers, instead usually get the worst. I know that the education I received made all the difference in my life, and it really upsets me to know that millions of children in this country right now aren't getting a quality education and therefore have little hope of escaping the poverty that they were born into. So with that, I'd like to talk to you about three things I've learned based on my own experiences as a, as a young man, being a father to three teenage daughters today, and my involvement with education reform for the past 27 years. The idea for my first one came from my youngest daughter who just turned 14. 
I've done lots of public speaking, but I've never addressed an audience of young adults like yourselves, so I asked her what I should say. Her suggestion was, tell them about your number one immutable law of the universe, which is something I've been saying to my daughters for years. Against the advice of some of my friends, I decided to share it with you in all its unfiltered glory. So here goes. If you are a dumbass, there will be consequences. <laughs> now, I like it because it's memorable. I'm pretty sure the word dumbass has never been used in any commencement address ever. <laughs> the question is, is, is it meaningful? I think it is. Let me explain why using a sports analogy. Raise your hand if you like basketball, if you like playing it or watching it. Right? Yeah. Uh, I hear Eagle Brook had a good team this year. Um, I, I love the sport. I've been playing pickup basketball a few times a week for 30 years, and I've been an NBA fan ever since growing up here in New England. I was crazy about Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics. So one thing I've learned over all these years is, is that while the scorers get all the acclaim, it's defense that wins championships, not just in basketball, but in every sport. It's the same in life. The foundation of a successful life is playing defense, and by that I mean avoiding the obvious mistakes that can really set you back. I'm not talking about the big general things, like if you're mean to people, you don't expect to have many friends, if you're lazy and dishonest, you won't have much of a career, if you don't take care of your body, of course it's going to break down. No, I'm talking about the blindingly obvious things, ranging from touching a stove to see if it's hot, I did that once, uh, 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 touching an electric fence to see if it's live, I did that too, um, all the way up to things that can derail or end a life. Let me tell you about a young guy I know named Gennaro Wilson. Born to a single mother, he grew up poor in a dangerous neighborhood in Atlanta. Despite attending a series of tough schools, he was doing well in high school. He got good grades, was the star of the football team, was elected homecoming king, and he was on his way to being the first person in his family to go to college. But then during his senior year, he went to a wild party, got drunk, and to make a very long and tragic story short, ended up in Georgia State Prison for two years. Believe it or not, I've actually been in jail, in Zimbabwe, no less for overstaying my visa. Talk about a bonehead move. After I pled guilty, the judge banged his gavel and said, I hereby sentence the defendant to 30 days in jail. My heart leaped into my mouth. I thought I was going to faint. And then he continued, or pay a $10 fine. Guess, guess which I chose. But look, I don't think any of you are going to end up in prison. That's not likely to be the thing that derails your life. So let me tell you what is. The biggie is alcohol. Now that you're going off to high school and only three years from now, college, you will soon be surrounded by heavy drinking. One study showed that 37% of American college students have, in the previous two weeks, engaged in binge drinking, defined as five consecutive drinks. And, it's, and these days, it's not beer, it's hard alcohol. You will likely face a lot of pressure to join in. My oldest daughter, a couple of years ago, when she was a senior in high school, uh, lost a lot of her friends, many uh, dating back to kindergarten because she didn't drink, so they didn't invite her to their parties. That hurt her a lot, but I'm really proud of her not succumbing to peer pressure. I'm not saying you should be a teetotaler. Go ahead, have a drink or two, maybe even three, but be really careful about getting totally smashed because there are so many permanently bad things that can happen. Every week I read in the paper about teenagers dying in a car accident uh, thanks to drinking or increasingly texting while driving. So maybe you're thinking, okay, I'll be safe. I'll just walk home from the party. Not so fast. Really drunk people um, are far more likely to have terrible accidents falling off a balcony or getting hit by a car going home. Statistically speaking, you're five times more likely to die walking home from a party than driving home from a party drunk. So lastly, if you drink frequently and heavily, there's a real risk of becoming an alcohol alcoholic. I have a relative who started drinking heavily in high school and never stopped. It's ruined his life. So by now you're probably thinking, geez, what kind of commencement speaker is this? What a downer he is. When's he going to tell us how great we are, how our future is so bright, we need sunglasses, and how we need to seize the day? Well, you are, and you should. But the reason I started with these stories is because the foundation for a successful life is playing good defense. If you want to get ahead, you first have to start by not falling behind. So now let's turn to the fun stuff, playing offense, being successful in life. I have great news for you. The, the fact that you're graduating from Eagle Brook means that your odds of success in life are already off the charts. You've received a great education so far and will surely continue to. The vast majority of you have families who love and support you, and you've never known, nor will you ever know, violence, hunger, or homelessness, the kinds of things I saw up close growing up in Tanzania and Nicaragua that I see when I visit my parents and sister who live in Kenya today, and that I see every time I visit a school in an inner city neighborhood in the United States. 
So congratulations, you're well on your way to winning the game of life. But you still need to make a lot of good decisions and avoid a lot of bad ones along the way. I have plenty of experience with both, so I'd like to share two more pieces of advice. But relax, I'm not going to lecture you. Uh, instead, I'd like to tell you a few stories about my life and experiences that I hope will help you achieve some of the success and happiness that I'm fortunate enough to have. Before I do so, however, I want you to do some thinking. Look around at all of your classmates um, and ponder this question. Who do you think is going to be really successful in life? Not just financially, but in every way. And as you think about it, what are the characteristics you're focusing on? Uh, is he smart? Does he work really hard and not give up easily? Does he have integrity? Is his word his bond? Is he 100% reliable? Is he well organized? Does he take care of himself and not take foolish risks? Is he a nice person and a pleasure to spend time with? Does he make the world a better place? So now ask yourself, what is he doing that I can't do? I think you'll find that at least 90% of these traits are things over which you have total control. So you see, you don't need me to tell you what habits you should try to adopt. You already know. They're, there's no secret. They're obvious. So the real question is, is what are you going to do about it? The world's most famous investor, Warren Buffett, tells young people the following. You can transform yourself into the person you want to be, but you have to decide early because the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they are too heavy to be broken. Think about that. All of the little things you do dozens of times every day, your habits define who you are. And once those patterns are set, they're really hard to change. So if you remember anything from today, I hope it will be this. It's critically important to develop good habits early in life. I'm not going to spend any time today talking about the obvious good habits, eating healthily, exercising regularly, as important as they are. I'm only going to talk about two. Work hard, be nice. This is the motto of KIPP charter schools. As I mentioned earlier, I've been on the board of KIPP in New York for more than a dozen years, but nationally it's a network of 183 schools in 20 states, 70,000 students, almost all of whom are poor and either African American or Latino. And what KIPP is doing inspires me. For example, KIPP students are five times more likely to earn a four-year college, uh, four college degree uh, than their peers. And on the walls of every KIPP school is the slogan, work hard, be nice. It's so simple that you might dismiss it, but if you think about it, 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 those four words capture an awful lot of what you need to be successful in life. So let's first talk about work hard. You all are still a long ways away from the working world, so, so uh, for most of you, this is just about school. I can't stress how important it is for you to get into the habit of learning. Your single greatest asset is your mind, and how you develop it will largely determine how far you go. Today, I consider myself a learning machine. I basically read nonstop all day, every day. And not just about investing, which is my job, but I try to read as broadly as possible. In my entire life, I have never met a single person who I consider to be well-educated who doesn't read a lot. You can start by becoming a learning machine today. Download the app of a major newspaper like the New York Times onto your phone and start reading it every day. Try to read a high-quality book every week or two, especially during the summer when you don't have as many demands on your time. I'm embarrassed to admit that I wasn't always a learning machine. Despite attending some of the best schools in the world, Eagle Brook, Northfield Mount Hermon, Harvard, Harvard Business School, most of the time I cut as many corners as I could, um, and as a result, I didn't learn as much as I could have. There were exceptions, of course, when I was truly engaged in my learning. I had incredible, um, it started right here, when I first discovered what an exceptional education really was. I had incredible teachers like Moni Chase in her class on the Revolutionary War. Uh, she got me so interested in the topic that I just dove in and learned everything I could about that time period. I especially remember the mock trial we had for Benedict Arnold, in which I was his defense attorney. What a learning experience, even though they still hung my client. <laughs> Every one of you is going to attend a good high school and college. Don't waste this incredible opportunity by skating through like I did. For every class, even, or perhaps especially, the ones that aren't naturally the most interesting to you, uh, dive in and learn as much as you can. And never let up. It doesn't end with formal schooling. If you want to be successful in life, you need to be a lifelong learning machine, or everyone else is going to pass you by. One last thought on work hard. It's not just putting in a lot of hours. It's, it's also overcoming obstacles, having grit, determination, resilience. All of us face setbacks in life. It's how we handle them that's critical. Once, one study measured students' ID, uh, excuse me, IQ, and also their grit. And it turns out that grit was twice as important in determining life outcomes. 
Okay, so now let's talk about the other part uh, of work hard, be nice. Um, be nice. Another way of saying this is, is don't be a jerk. Now, I'm sure this sounds really simple, uh, but it didn't characterize me for most of my youth. I wasn't a bad kid, but I sure was full of myself. School came easily to me, so I looked down on other kids who I didn't think were as smart. And I was a terrible listener, but boy did I love to hear myself talk. I was much more interested in myself than anybody else. As a result, teachers liked me plenty, but many of my classmates rightly, rightly viewed me as arrogant and obnoxious. I had a few close friends, but that was it. In my junior year of high school, my best friend Bob and I ran for class co-presidents. Uh, we, were, we looked great on paper. We were great students. We knew the school well. We had a solid platform. But we lost to two students uh, who were known for being potheads. So why? Simple. Outside of a, a small circle of friends, Bob and I weren't really well liked. A lot of students thought that we looked down on them, and they were right. So today, I'd like to think I'm much less of a jerk than I was back then, thanks to a few things. Uh, number one, 26 years ago, I got really lucky. I met and married a wonderful woman who makes me a better person. I wish all of you similar good fortune in finding the right life partner. Nothing will make a greater impact on your long-term happiness. Number two, I met, uh, I've met so many extraordinary people that I don't seem so extraordinary in comparison. That's, it's, it's humbled me. And lastly, I read a classic old book called, first published in 1936 called How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a corny title, I know, but it's sold more than 30 million copies. Its most important lessons can be summarized in three sentences. Most people don't care very much about you. They mainly care about themselves. So if you want people to like you, show genuine interest in and appreciation for them. The book was such a revelation to me. All these years, and I thought people were as interested in me as I was in myself, but they weren't. I know it sounds crazy, but other people will not only like you more, they will think you are more interesting the less you talk about yourself and the more you ask them about themselves. I'm not kidding. Try it and you'll see. And then keep doing it the rest of your life. Another part of not being a jerk is being grateful. I hope you are aware of and grateful every day for what you have. My, wife's, my best friend's wife works at a KIPP school in the toughest, poorest neighborhood in Philadelphia. And the story she tells me break my heart. Students your age who can barely read. And just this week, she told me about one of her students, a good kid whose mother kicked him out of their house, and he now has a choice, be homeless or go live with his father who beats him. At least these children are lucky enough to attend a KIPP school, which gives them a fighting chance in life. But they're the lucky few. The vast majority of kids like these attend dilapidated, underfunded, overcrowded schools in which little, if any, learning is going on. So the last thing I'd like to talk about, also related to be nice, is being a giving person. My parents always told my sister and me, and this is from an email my mom just sent me last week to remind me, you have been born into the best time in world history, and mostly by accident of birth have been given every opportunity, love, education, health, exposure to the world, and a decent living standard. If you take these gifts and use them simply to enrich yourself, then you and we will have failed. To be a success, you have an obligation to make the world a better place. Now, I know it's a cliche, but as the saying goes, if it's trite, it's right. Um, and then and there was an important added bonus. I discovered that the more I gave, the more I got back in return. For me, giving back, becoming a giving machine, has been a combination of big things like full-time jobs, starting new nonprofit organizations, serving on boards like KIPP, the things I've already talked about. But it's also a lot of little things. So there's so many examples I could give, but here's one I do every day. If I find a mess, I clean it up. Yes, even if I didn't make it. My pet peeve these days is my daughter's leaving the dirty dishes in the sink. Trust me, if you go through life leaving messes for other people to clean up, like I used to, they're going to resent you. In contrast, if you not only clean up after yourself, but after others, if you do more than your fair share, if you offer the other, other person the bigger piece of dessert, if you remember their birthday, if you give them an unexpected gift, it will make such a difference. Since I started becoming a much more giving person about 20 years ago, the quality of my life has improved exponentially. Why? For starters, it makes me feel good. I also have many more close friends, and they forgive me and stay my friends even when I screw up and do something that makes them mad at me, which I'm prone to doing more often than I'd like to admit. And when I ask a favor of someone, they're more likely to say yes. A month from now, I'm climbing two famous peaks in Europe, Mont Blanc and the Matterhorn, to raise money for kits. I've been hitting up all my friends, and they've already donated nearly $100,000. Lastly, while this may sound crass, having a well-deserved reputation as a good guy is good for my business. 
Other investors are more inclined to share investment ideas with me. My investors are more likely to stay in my fund rather than yanking their money when my performance stinks, which it has in the past year. So to repeat what I said earlier, the more I give, the more I get back, and it leads to an immeasurably happier, happier life. I've thrown a lot at you here, so let me, let me quickly summarize. Defense wins championships, work hard, and be nice. If you do these things, I promise that you'll lead a long and rewarding life filled with love, laughter, and happiness. It's yours for the taking. Thank you, and congratulations to the class of 2016.